Hey, what's up YouTubers and welcome back to another Toddy Walnuts update video. Today is going to be a rather short video because I only have a couple things to show today. I have a couple figures that I recently picked up. I got some animated classics from my childhood. A couple of those are Disney movie exclusives. I picked up a couple titles from Arrow Video and I got a couple box sets from Indicator Powerhouse in the UK. So the first thing I'm going to get into is the figures that I picked up and the first one is the Hobbit an unexpected journey this is a figure that was a comic-con exclusive from San Diego back in 2013 I had this one on my radar for a long long time it's a very pricey and rare figure but I found it on eBay from a secondhand seller who owned a comic book shop and he owned quite a bit of like limited edition um, hardcover comics and uh, graphic novels and comic books and figures and stuff like that. So I picked this up at a good price. It's in brand new light condition, even though it's six years old. It's never been unboxed before. And this is the figure of Azog, the pale orc, when he takes King Thror's head in the second Hobbit movie. And it's a very, very cool figure. It's a little bit reflective there, and it's uh, showing a little bit of glare. But um, Azog is probably one of my favorite characters in the entire series. I really like him. And I like his son, Bolg, too, who was also um, a big player in the Lord of the Rings series. And uh, King Thror was the father of Thrain and the grandfather of Thorin. Thorin was another one of my favorite characters. And they called Azog the Pale Orc or Azog the Defiler. And sometimes they even called him Azog the Goblin, even though he was an orc. And I know I just sounded like a complete nerd there, but I really love these. The Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings series, one of the best uh, series ever, in my opinion. And there's a little bit of uh, write-up about Azog. And this one also does come with the the little um, claw that they made when Thorin was in battle and he cut off Azog's right arm at the forearm. And Thorin thought that he had killed him during that battle, but he did not die, as you guys know. And you see him again later in the Battle of the Five Armies, but you actually see him in part two as well. He comes back, but uh, this was limited to 2,600 pieces. I got number 2038, and I'm very glad to have this edition, this piece for my collection. Uh, the seller also threw in a stack of Hobbit collector's cards. I'll go through these at the very end. That way, if you're not interested, you can cut out of the video, but if you'd like to stick around and watch, I'll go through this little stack of cards. I haven't even looked at them yet. But uh, it was pretty nice that the seller threw that in. I'm not really much of a baseball card collector or any kind of cards like this. But for some freebies, I'll go through and show you guys if you're interested in seeing that. So that was uh, Azog the Defiler, Azog the Pale Orc. I plan at some point picking up a Bolg because I really like Bolg a lot too. That is uh, Azog's son. Uh, he's, I think he's even more brutal than his dad was. They're, they're both huge. I think Bolg is even a little bit bigger than his dad, Azog. But uh, there's a, a statue of Bolg that you can get, and it's on eBay, and it's uh, really, really pricey. It's um, I think it's 18 inches. I think this is the 7-inch that I just showed you guys. The Bolg, you can get uh, a 6-inch for roughly 20 to 30 bucks, or you can get the statue, and I think it's a few hundred bucks. So I, I'm not going to pay that much for a statue of Bolg, but... I'll probably get the figure at some point. I picked up a sideshow collectible of uh, Jason Voorhees from Part 2. This is the Sackhead Jason. And these are really nice. And I believe these are the, they call it a 1-6 figure. And I believe these are 12 inch figures as opposed to the seven that NECA releases. It's a little bit bigger and it does come with the stand and it comes with the pickaxe and the bloody pitchfork. 
and you can see the the sack and it's all cloth real cloth that they use for the clothing and then you can see that they also threw in the uh, the cast but they have um, where is that they have Warrington Gillette playing Jason Voorhees but uh, Steve Dash was Jason Voorhees in part two You can see some of the write-ups about it. Really, really like these figures. They're a little pricey though, but they're these are like uh, big-time collectible pieces. They're they're really nice. They they seem like they kind of hold their value or go up a little bit over time. They don't really ever lose value for those sideshow collectible pieces. And if you guys are interested for that particular piece, I got it from a seller called Alien Entertainment kind of in my neck of the woods. I live in Wisconsin. Uh, I live in Racine, Wisconsin, which is right in between Chicago, Illinois, and Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So it's kind of a uh, convenient little place to live. So, But if you're interested in checking out any of the stuff that he has, he had all kinds of different collectibles. Uh, you can check out Alien Entertainment on any of these sites. You can go on Facebook and check them out if you guys go to Twitter or any of that stuff, or if you wanna just go to his website alienentertainment.com he threw me in that little postcard with that I picked up a couple of Disney exclusives this one was really cool I was happy to grab this one even though I have it a few times already on quite a few formats I have the VHS the DVD a different blu-ray edition of this um, I have a digi book and a steel book of it but I wanted to get the Disney Movie Club exclusive limited release and this one came with the film cell now it's not an authentic film cell, it is a replica, but it looks really cool and I checked it out and I put it in here already. It came loose, but I put it inside so I don't lose it. But it's just a, a DVD and Blu-ray. And then if you look, if you hold it up to the light, I don't know if you guys can see that, but it is, uh, I'm getting more of a reflection than anything else. There's a better viewing, I guess. You can see um, what you call it, uh, Baloo and uh, Mowgli. And uh, this is a film frame replica. But it does look really cool and they threw it in this like little collector's uh, envelope, plastic sleeve thingy. And I'm glad to grab this and pick it up and add it to the Disney collection, especially these limited edition exclusives seem to uh, go up in value. And the thing about these is if you don't grab them now and you wait till they're sold out and you do want it eventually, you're gonna have to pay probably three times the value it is now. I think I got this on the uh, Disney Movie Club for about 20 bucks or so. And eventually when this goes out of print and it, it won't take long, that this will be up probably 60, 70 bucks. So you know how that goes, those scalpers on secondary markets. I also picked up the animated edition of 101 Dalmatians, another Disney Movie Club exclusive. I think I got both of these together for about 40 bucks with shipping from the Disney Movie Club. So that's not bad. And it came pretty quick. I ordered it and I think it was here with like within a week. So, so I actually pre-ordered the Jungle Book because that just came out but I ordered these two together and they shipped together and I'm having a hard time with those. So I'm gonna put that together off camera. I also did pick up a Hanna-Barbera series, although this is a live action series. It only lasted one season. This is called Korg, 70,000 BC, the complete series. It only lasted one season, 19 episodes. It came out in 1974, 75. And Hanna-Barbera produced this. They wanted it to be kind of an educational, Neanderthal type film that was kind of made both for children and adults and they tried to educate people by um, showing how they thought or how they felt that the Neanderthals lived like through the winters and how they hunted and how they survived with the food that they had to ration and feed their tribes and all that stuff. Um, this was the sh a kind of show that it got poor ratings when it first came out in 74 and they canceled it after one season. But when they started showing it in, 
in syndication, it kind of gained a cult following, and this this show actually kind of picked up steam, and they ended up making a, I think it was, um, they made a board game. I think Milton Bradley made a board game, and I think, um, what else was there? They had, uh, I think they had toys and stuff like that that they tried to market off of this uh, show, off the popularity that it was getting from the syndication. So uh, this is a two disc set and these are what they call manufactured on demand MOD and um, these are official discs but they're they're burned to order I guess and they're, it's very very cheap to get these I think this was only it was under 15 bucks it was probably like 10 to 12 bucks on Amazon I picked this up so it was new I just opened it so I can show you guys but I do remember watching this as a kid in syndication and they used to show this on Saturday mornings with the, in the Saturday morning cartoon lineup. Even though it wasn't a cartoon, they would throw in some some live action every once in a while. And um, noteworthy to know that Burgess Meredith narrates this. And uh, I do remember him, and he did a very good job uh, as the narrator for this. So I was glad to add that to the Hanna-Barbera collection. I picked up a code red title this is called blackout and this is a movie I have never seen before but it sounds intriguing and I do like to collect the code red the night the prowler I'm sorry the night the power failed and the shock began this is code red spine 178 psychopaths on the loose in a city without lights no one is safe and the film takes place in New York and it's always fun to watch the the vintage vintage style films from what year did this come out anyway doesn't say on the back I want to say this was late 70s and uh, John Saxon wrote the screenplay for this and it, let's see who else was in the movie Robert Carradine is in the film and uh, this was a collaboration between Shout Factory and Code Red and it is approximately 89 minutes, region A, anamorphic widescreen, rated R. But you do get uh, some special features. You get a, a new uncut HD master of the film. You get some on-camera interviews with uh, Robert Carradine. You get some audio commentary with uh, Belinda J. Montgomery in an original trailer. And this doesn't have much for anything on the inside, just the disc, which looks pretty cool. And I'm looking forward to checking this out. If anybody has seen this, let me know in the comments without giving any spoilers. Let me know what you thought of it. A couple Arrow titles I picked up. This was a upgrade for me. I do own this movie a few different times already, different editions of it. But this is the Arrow Blu-ray edition of Kioma, starring Franco Nero. This is the US release, Region A says it is all region ABC. It is, um, you can watch it with English audio or Italian audio. You can also watch it with subtitles. And it is 101 minutes running time. The film is from 1976. And you get a bunch of special features here. You get a new 2K restoration. And I'm not going to go through all of that stuff. If you want to pause it and read that, there is a lot of stuff. Um, the one thing that stuck out to me was uh, there's a, a little featurette called Writing Kioma, a previously unseen interview with actor and writer Luigi Montef Montefiore, who is uh, George Eastman. So that's got to be pretty cool to check that out, a vintage interview that's never been shown before. Looking forward to checking that out for sure. So that is Kioma. There is the disc. There's the reversible cover, which I really like. I think these are both very good. That is the retro cover right there. And this one here is the newly commissioned. 
Let's see who the artist is, if it says. Sean Phillips did the newly commissioned artwork. So that's very cool. You get a pretty decent sized booklet. I was flipping through this earlier, it looked pretty cool. Pretty decent size. I would say it's probably 25 to 30 pages. I'll just flip through it. Yeah, it's about 25 to 30 pages. Probably closer to 30. He plays a really good villain. That is, um, I forget his name offhand. I don't want to take up too much of your time here. Maybe I'll write it in at the end in the uh, comments below. This is a later Spaghetti Western because the heyday of Spaghetti Westerns was the late 60s, mid to late 60s, in the 65, 66, 67 range. That's when it was at its peak. And this was about a decade after the peak of the Spaghetti Western. And then we got an art card, Horrors of Malformed Men, which I just recently ordered in Arrow's um, sale that they're having right now. This uh, title was only $7.50 Great Britain Pounds, which comes out to about, I think, roughly close to 10 bucks US dollars. So I grabbed it and a few others, but you guys will have to wait and see what I picked up. I think I picked up about eight or nine titles. I always try to grab the Arrow sales when I can, if I got the money for it, just like uh, Criterion when those go 50%. I try to grab at least one or a couple if I can afford it at that time. Here's one that I had never seen before either, and I'm looking forward to checking this one out. This one is called The Iguana with the Tongue of Fire. Now that's a title for you right there. A film by Ricardo Frida. And I'm not really familiar with that gentleman's work, and I've never seen the film before. But how can you pass up a movie like this, just the way it looks and the way it sounds, and it's a giallo film. It says, one of the several animal in the title cash-ins released in the wake of Dario Argento's box office smash, The Bird with the Crystal Plumage. There are all the special features. And this is artwork commissioned by Graham Humphreys. I know Arrow likes to go to Graham Humphreys quite a bit. He's done a lot of some of their best artwork. He's really good. There's a reversible cover. That looks really cool too, that's the Italian cover. Here again is the, oops, dropped it. A little um, art card for Horrors of Malformed Men, which is a Japanese horror film from the late 60s and I'm looking forward to checking it out. This is one that I, I wanted to get for a while. I just didn't get around to it and I figured now during their sale I'm gonna grab it. I love Japanese cinema but for, to me, Japanese cinema, you have to be in the right frame of mind to sit and watch it because it's a little different, you know, and, and you got to get in the right frame of mind. And once you do, you can have like a little marathon of Japanese movies. But it, for me, it's not something I can sit and watch every day. No offense to people who love Japanese films. I do too. I just have to be in the right frame and, and watch them when I feel like it. But really nice book. Again, it's probably 30 pages or more. If anybody has seen this one, let me know. Talk about it below and uh, don't give any spoilers. Arrow, what are you doing to me here? I never used to do that. Really nice though, really uh, crisp images, stills from the uh, film. Tons of write-ups as you guys can see. And it has that new movie smell. Look at some of the um, throwbacks, I guess, for the uh, Italian poster. That's pretty cool. Yeah, definitely going to check this one out really quick. I may even watch this one tonight. So that 
is the iguana with the tongue of fire. And those were my two arrow pickups. Now we'll get into the two box sets that I got. I was going to do separate videos for these, but I don't really feel like it. I'm just going to throw them all together in one video. And this is volume three from Indicator Powerhouse of the Hammer films. And I think the only one that, I think the only one I may have seen was the Terror of the Tongs, but I, I can't remember for sure if I did or not. The one that sounds the coolest to me is The Camp on Blood Island. That just sounds like a, a backwoods slasher. Those are the kind of movies I like, but I'm not sure. I haven't seen the movie. So we'll get into this and we'll go through. I'm sure probably many of you guys already own this or you've seen unboxings, but I'm going to do my own unboxing. And you're welcome to stick around and watch. This was limited to 6,000. I got number 3815. And you can see here on the back are the four titles. The one on the left, The Camp on Blood Island. Yesterday's Enemy, The Stranglers of Bombay, and The Terror of the Tongs. I'm pretty sure I did see this one years and years ago. And The Camp on Blood Island was released in 58, black and white. Yesterday's Enemy was released in 59, it is also black and white. The Stranglers of Bombay, 1959, it was also black and white. And The Terror of the Tongs, 1961, it is in color. These are all region, and I'm, I think this just came out recently, and I'm pretty sure this is going to sell out fast because the other ones did, and uh, I was lucky enough to get the, the first two. I pre-ordered those. I did not pre-order this one, but I did buy it directly from uh, Indicator on their website. So if you guys are interested and you, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe not, I would go ahead and grab it just in case because it, it will sell out pretty quick and you'll probably kick yourself if it sells out and you didn't grab it. So let's take a look here and see what it looks like on the inside. And thanks to my buddy Lee, who is LSJ Shez. He was the one that taught me about the terminology for this little piece of cardboard that goes around the, the box set and it's called a belly band. I had never heard that term before or since, but I, I'll take his word for it. I call it a belly band now. If that's what Lee wants to call it. Uh, no, I'm kidding. But yeah, I, I, I never knew that before. But um, So that's what we'll call it, a belly band. <laughs> so here's the back again. These are all the special features. Everything is newly restored in high def. I just got a text and I hope that didn't screw up my screen. Well, there's interviews, there's, I mean, there's so much to go on here. So if you, I don't know if you guys wanna pause that and, and read it. There's commentary, lots of commentary. Archival audio recordings, interviews, with anybody you can think. I mean, script super supervisor has an interview in here. So there's an interview with the composer. So, and I can tell, I mean, this is uh, top notch quality as far as box sets come out. If, if, you, if you're gonna spend a lot of money, like we do as collectors, we spend a lot of money, like it or not. I mean, fa you gotta face it, we spend a lot of money on our products that we buy. You want something like this. You know, I get nothing from Indicator. I even, I, I went out, I, I reached out to them and asked them if they would like me to be a uh, reviewer for their product and they told me no thank you. So I get nothing from them. Every, anytime I buy something, I pay full price. But I love their quality, I really do. And um, the money I pay, I know that's money in the bank for me that I'm gonna get something that I enjoy that's gonna be around for a while. Sometimes some of the box sets from like Severin, they're really thin. Um, I'm not trying to nitpick, I'm just saying it like it is. But anyway, let's get into the movies here. The Camp on Blood Island. I'm looking forward to checking this one out. I don't think I've ever seen this one before. There's the disc, it is all region, like I said before. There is a reversible cover. And you get a pretty thick book. 
feels like it's about 30 pages or so. We'll flip through it. Oh, oh that guy's not... He's not in for a good time, is he? Oh, this is really... You can see the gloss on the pages from the flash. I mean, it, this is a really, really nice book. Very, very nicely done here. Very, very nice quality. Nice crisp black and white images from the film. There we go again. So yeah, it looks like uh, this is already 23 pages. And it looks like it finishes up on 39, 40 pages. The Brutal Truth Behind the Japanese War Crime. That is, that is the camp on Blood Island. Next one is called Yesterday's Enemy. Another one I've never seen before. And there you have all the special features again. I'm just going to keep moving. I didn't want to make this video too long, and we're already approaching kind of uh, close to the half hour mark. I think probably a lot of you have checked out by now. Pretty cool reversible cover, retro feel to it. Here's another 40 page book, really heavy, in it, and you can tell that the uh, quality of the book is really nice. Just by holding it and feeling that it's it's a very heavy, thick pages, glossy pages, another 40 pager. I'm just gonna kind of flip so you guys can see. I'm sorry if I went too fast. I just wanna keep this moving. But I mean, it is very, very nice. You can see the, um, the quality and the attention to detail they, that they put into this, it's very nice and it's appreciated. The next one is called The Stranglers of Bombay. There's the retro style. That would probably be either lobby cards or um, the theatrical poster, but I, I'm sure a lot of these probably did, weren't shown at mainstream theaters. These were probably shown at like the Grindhouse theaters and stuff like that. Possibly even drive-ins. Another 40-page book, I'm guessing, seems to be the theme here. And uh, it is very, very nice. I love black and white. I've I've always been a fan of black and white. Going back to my childhood, watching the Alfred Hitchcock shows and Twilight Zone. But I've even grown more fond of it the older I get. I I can just uh, really appreciate. The black and white pictures, I really love them. I think they're great. And here is The Terror of the Tongs, starring Christopher Lee. Matter of fact, I think I own this on DVD, Region 1. I'll have to double check. This is the one of the four that is in color. The rest were black and white. There, if you want to pause that, you can check out the special features again that's a really nice cover I love that retro style look
Let's see if I can give you guys a little flip through without taking too much time. But I do want to kind of cover these, but not, you know, I don't want to go too in depth, but I don't want to just blow through them either. So Ooh, that's a nice looking lady right there. Hey, that is Yvonne Manlauer. And I'm sure I've seen her somewhere before, but I just can't place it. She's probably probably been in quite a few films. She's very attractive. So let's see what. Okay, that's just that's the cast and crew. Okay, oh, here's the uh, cast right here. So that was number four out of four for the box set called Hammer Volume 3 Blood and Terror. Hope you guys were able to pick this up. Let me know, comment below if you were able to grab this one or if you plan on grabbing it. I just wouldn't wait too long because these sets do go out of print. I think the Harryhausen Volume 1 just recently went out of print and it's probably through the roof as far as price goes now. So. Let's check out this last one, and then if you guys want to stick around and go through the Hobbit cards, feel free to, or if you want to check out anytime you want, then leave. That's fine. I would not blame you a bit. If you watch it all the way through, comment below and let me know. So this is called the William Castle Volume 2 at Columbia. I do have Volume 1 coming. That's going to be going through a trade. I'm not going to talk too much about that right now. But when that trade comes through, I will talk more about it at that time. But I do have volume one coming. This is volume two. We're going to go through this. Again, it's a really nice, heavy, solid box set here from Indicator Powerhouse. And this was uh, also limited to 6,000. I'm trying to really move this release it without it was a little snug on there on this one this was limited to 6,000 I got number 362 and here are the four titles it is it looks like it's um, Zotz Z-O-T-Z -Z, Zotz 13 Frightened Girls The Old Dark House and Straight Jacket starring Joan Crawford that's cool and here you can see some of the cool retro looking cover that they went there for on the uh, box set. Very, very nice. Here we're not going to go through all the special features, but you can see that it is a ton of special features. The four films inside we have Zots from 1962, 13 Frightened Girls from 1963. The Old Dark House from 63 and Straight Jacket 63. Now, the two films that are black and white are Zots and Straight Jacket. The other two are color. It is all region. We'll take a look at these. Oh, again, I mean, it's just beautiful. It's a beautiful piece of work here. It's just a nice hardcover. And uh, just you can feel the quality in it. So I guess the first one we'll pull from is a straight jacket starring Joan Crawford. There you can see the special features if you want to pause that and check it out. This one is region B. There is the reverse, which looks really good. I like that one. Let's see. Oh, wow, they're both pretty good. Yeah, I think I think I will stay with that one. I do like that one. There's the Foxy Joan Crawford. Another 40-page booklet here. We'll flip through it real quick. It's like half of it flips and the rest of it's stuck.
but just like anything you get from Arrow or any of the other companies, indicators right up there with quality with their special features, their books, their booklets, the box sets. Everything is high quality, high end stuff. So you know when you're ordering something from them, you know you're getting your money's worth. At least that's the way I feel about it. Here is the old dark house. That's a pretty cool title that kind of draws you in. I think they could have probably had a little bit of a better cover though to really pull you in because it almost looks cartoonish and comedic. You got kind of like a Frankenstein hand holding a skeleton key and who knows maybe this is a, a comedy horror I'm not sure I've never seen it but you got the uh, quite a bit of special features here. This one's all region. You can see the disc. There's Tom Poston right there. And I'm not sure who the co-star is. Um, Jeanette Scott. She's very pretty. There's kind of the same version of the Uh, they both, even though they kind of darkened up the hand, it still looks cartoonish to me. Looks like something you'd see on Scooby-Doo. Nothing, I love Scooby-Doo, nothing against Scooby-Doo. I'm just saying they could have made that cover a little more scary, I guess. I don't know. I'm not nitpicking. I'm just kind of sharing my opinion about it. That's all. Miss Hannah decided to join us. She just came in. So that is the first one, the, the old dark house. Oh, that was the second one. We looked at straight jacket already. All right. The next one is called 13 Frightened Girls. The Big Fright, The Eerie Sight. And uh, this one has quite a bit of special features. Filmed from 1963, all region. Shh. I got the windows open again. It's been beautiful. Here, I got a question for you guys, just to see if you guys are paying attention and see if you're watching my videos. If you feel like it, comment down below. Let me know where you're located and what the weather's been like for the last couple days. Cause I'm in Wisconsin right now and the temperature was beautiful today. I think it reached right around 60, but it's been kind of hanging around between 45 and 60, which is really good. I know the weather, the better weather's coming, but for Wisconsin, that's great because our, our winters are like six months long. So anytime we can get in the fifties and sixties, it's like summer for us really. But uh, this is 13 Frightened Girls back to that. Some little cuties up there. Some little hotties from from the uh, 50s and 60s. But they're silly haircuts, right? It wasn't silly back then, though. <laughs> that was the style. And finally, oh, you guys are probably wondering when am I going to wrap this up. This is the last one. Like I said, I will show the, the Hobbit cards, but if you don't want to watch it, you don't have to. This is Zots, another Tom Posted movie. All region, there is the Special Features box. 1962 film. There's a very young Tom Poston. I didn't realize that he did a lot of collabs with uh, Castle. Apparently so. Castle, William Castle is somebody I really like his movies. I, I, I mean, he has a probably, you know, a dozen movies that were great, but I don't really know much about William Castle, to be honest with you. He's, he's just somebody I've never really read up on before. I should remedy that. I should do a little research on William Castle because he does have some really good movies. He had a great career. So, okay guys, we'll do a wrap up here and then uh, 
like a little bonus segment at the end if you want to stick around I'll go through those cards but here is the William Castle volume 2 box set from Indicator Powerhouse limited to 6,000 here is the Hammer volume 3 Blood and Terror limited to 6,000 then we have Arrow Video the iguana with the tongue of fire and Franco Nero as Kioma from a later spaghetti western from the late six uh, late 70s I'm sorry I believe it was 76 they said so um, got a blackout from Code Red <clears throat> Cottonmouth is killing me right now I can barely talk I got Korg 70,000 BC I gotta pause it here and go get a drink, guys. I'll be right. <coughs> okay, and we're back. And my drink of choice tonight: um, Canada Dry Ginger Ale. Love Canada Dry Ginger Ale. Again, I don't get any product from them, but I like to pass it along. <laughs> oh yeah. So I got Korg, seventy thousand BC, the complete series, which was nineteen episodes. And I'm looking forward to, I, I'm pretty sure I did not see all 19 episodes, but as a kid, I do remember watching it. And I remember, and I know it has nothing to do with the Planet of the Apes at all, but I remember watching it when I was a kid and I felt like it had elements of that type of show. But that is Korg, 70,000 BC. And then I had a couple... Disney Movie Club exclusives, 101 Dalmatians, and the Jungle Book. So thank you for watching, guys. Take care, and I will see you in the next video. If you want to stick around for a couple minutes, we can go through these Hobbit cards. Let's see what he sent to me. Okay. Oh. Uh, We'll go through this little contraption thing here. How many of you guys collect cards? I know it was big back in the 90s when I was a kid. Collecting baseball and football cards like that. <coughs> collect all 12. These two limited edition cards. Okay, these were, it looks like it was from Denny's, the pancake puppies. So there you have... Frodo. I'm sorry, I said that before in the other video too. That is Bilbo, the burglar from The Hobbit. Frodo was in The Lord of the Rings. There's Balin. He was like kind of the voice of reason to me because the dwarves, they were, they were kind of a, a rowdy, a rowdy bunch and they were quick to fight. You know, they, they were even though they were small, they didn't back down from anybody, but it was almost like they were too quick to fight. You don't want to get, you don't want to do that. You know, you want to make sure that you, you're level-headed when you're going into battle or a fight. And he was, Balin was always the one that was kind of like, you know, let's think this through. Dwalin, he was the, like, I think he was the biggest dwarf. I got a kick out of it when uh, Gandalf told Bilbo he said, I remember he had a relative that was big enough to ride a real horse. Because <laughs> Hobbit, I think he had to ride like a little mule or a pony or something. There's Feely. Feely and Keely were brothers, and they were nephews of Thorin. And Keely fell in love with um, one of the elves. Galadriel. Gandalf. There's Gollum. What is it, precious? Radagast the Brown. He was pretty funny. He was kind of like the comedy relief. Because under his hat he had a bird's nest and all the, the bird shit was like flowing down his face into his beard. He didn't care. He was like a, uh, he loved all the wildlife. He had all those fast rabbits that were pulling his sleigh through the woods. 
There's Thorin. He's one of my favorite characters. I was sad that he died at, at the end of part three, but I mean, if you read the books, you know what happens, and it's just part of it. That was, uh, it was nice that guy threw in that little stack of cards for me. I don't know what I would ever do with these, but I'll probably just put them in a drawer somewhere. I don't think cards are as collectible or as um, valuable as they used to be. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm wrong because uh, I've been out of that game for a long, long time. So it looks like he threw in a game. I mean, it looks like these might be game pieces or something. I'm not sure. Maybe you guys can tell me because it just shows like a blue card in the back. And then it says one ring, the ruling ring, the gray wizard. It's probably some kind of a hobbit. Uh, like a Magic the Gathering type game, I'm not sure. Samwise, Mary and Pip, Legolas, Gimli, Aragorn, Boromir. Those were all from Lord of the Rings. <clears throat> so there's a couple more here. Looks like we got a foil of Gandalf the White. says on the back that there was nine foil cards issued. There's another foil card. This one's a little more fancy because it looks like it has some kind of, uh, I don't know, like sparkles or, or uh, what do they call it, glitter, something mixed in. These are pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Masterpiece checklist. There's Christopher Lee. Hmm. He betrayed us, didn't he? There's Gandalf. And last, nope, there's two more. There's the old Bilbo. And then there is Gandalf again. So that was it, guys. Thank you for watching. Take care. Leave any comments below if you want to talk about any of these movies or if you want to let me know where you're from and how your weather has been. Just strike up a conversation. I don't know, whatever you guys want to talk about. If there's anything else you want to add or whatever, the uh, comment section is all yours. So, all right, guys, I'm going to take off, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Hope you guys are well. Later.